Honestly, I was impressed by the bare minimum. I was like, wow, she doesn't end it with abuser? What remarkable progress for Colleen Hoover. Hello, welcome to the start of another monthly reading vlog. The reason why I am with Elias and we are all dressed up is because we're actually about to go to a wedding. And this wedding is a couple that had traveled with us in Thailand last year and they very kindly had invited us to their wedding as well. Fortunately, it is near Elias's place. So we just have been back in our hometown for this weekend. Pira is also with us. Hello. He's been hiding under the bed. He's so lost. He doesn't know where he is. We are about to head out, but I wanted to take this opportunity to start a monthly reading vlog because when I was flying back from Paris to go back home, I read the majority of a book and it left me gagged. And this is going to be the biggest plot twist because that book was It Ends With Us by Colleen oh Hoover. And you know what? I ate that shit up. Oh my God. Now you're giving the first Colleen Hoover book five stars. It wasn't five stars. I wouldn't go that far but I did enjoy it there might be several factors for why I enjoyed it part of it could be the fact that I literally only had one hour of sleep before I had to wake up early to take an international flight so maybe that lack of sleep was me being delirious it's the delulu for me another reason is because it has some of my favorite tropes which is friends to lovers and the hurt comfort trope and I also feel like since I had recently read and filmed my review for very by Colleen Hoover, which was terrible. The bar was so low that you're like, wow. Exactly. The bar was extremely low. So then when I read it and I was like, oh my God, this isn't like doo-doo. This isn't as terrible as I thought it would be. Because everyone was saying that this romanticizes abuse, but I did not get that at all. I felt like it was pretty what? clear. No, it was pretty it's clear. It's the way Sydney was like, abuse over my head. At no, one, no. At one ear, at the other. It was very clear that the abusive relationship was wrong. Like, so there's a love triangle, right? The main guy is this abusive guy and we all know that he's a bad guy. The other guy is the guy that you're supposed to root for who's so sweet and cares for her and protects her and everything. So I was eating that shit You know why? Up. She loves men who are fucking simps. Yes! He was such a simp for her and I was like, period. Period. <laughs> I was literally reading that shit for him. He's her childhood friend, right? They have like abusive households basically and then like they bonded over that because they were like each other's havens. We find out about all of this stuff because we read her childhood diary entries but the thing is she writes them as letters to Ellen DeGeneres. You eat that shit up. Well, Ellen DeGeneres. Okay, I don't care about Ellen, but you know, since she was like, what, 14, 15, whatever, 16, you know, I thought it's kind of you know, funny. <laughs> I feel like the stuff that people really care, like were super adamant about and everything, you're like, Eh, whatever. It was, it was fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, again, I had read Verity beforehand, so... The bar was already in hell. Exactly. So I was like, oh, this like this is literally just like teenage oh, girl you writing to Ellen. You know what? Yeah. I read this book maybe three, four years ago. Yeah. I even gave it like three stars. I have given Colin Hoover books five stars before, so... Wait, which one? Which one? I Hopeless. Never heard of it. Hopeless. If y'all know, if you know, you know. It just tells you that some of the shit that Cindy has read, it's even surpassing. Um, oh, yeah. I've read way worse shit than this. <laughs> You're like, whatever, this is mid. You know, it is pretty mid compared to some of the hentai that I've read. You've read hentai? That's all I'm gonna say. So have I. <laughs> a hentai that I read before was The Erotic Tales of the Little Mermaid. Oh my god. And it was where, like, she lost her voice and the only way to make sure she stays alive as a human was to fuck her. That's how the prince gave his energy to her to keep her alive. So like Dang. they had to do it or else she would die. Wow. The Little Mermaid would have been different. Yeah, I don't remember that in the live action. But anyway, um, we gotta go to the wedding. So I will update you more on my full thoughts on Colleen Hoover. And also, obviously, since I've read Colleen Hoover, I must be compensated for this. So I want to thank today's sponsor for the video. This video has been sponsored by Fable, which is a community-powered app for finding, reading, and discussing books with other people. It's not very often that you find other people who are interested in the same books as you are, or even are reading as avidly as you are. So I love that Fable can you with other people who love to read and at the same time you can discover new books and you get to share your thoughts on whatever you're reading right now. It's basically like book Twitter or book Instagram but it's exclusively for books and readers. They had recently updated it with a for you feed. This is where you can see conversations about new books that are coming out or reviews of books that you might be interested in. Other features I really like is that you can start a buddy read or join a book club. You can also leave your own ratings and reviews for books and you also can leave half star ratings which is more than some 
other apps are able to do. If you want to follow me on Fable, you can check out my link in my description. That way you can see what books I'm talking about and what I'm reviewing because a lot of times my videos are uploaded months after I've already finished the book. Go ahead and comment my most recent post to share your thoughts. I will also provide a link for you to download the Fable app for free. And now let's go back to my reading vlog. back in San Francisco from the wedding. I got very drunk, which was my whole intention of going to the wedding. I mean, who cares about these beautiful memories and these cherished moments that are once in a lifetime. I'm here for the booze. It was also really nice just reuniting with people from the Thailand trip. One of them actually came from Belgium and she wanted to explore more around California. So I offered to host her in my Airbnb. She'll be here with me for the week, but right now she's out doing touristy things and I still have a daytime job to do. But in the meantime, I am taking a little break from work to update you on the rest of my thoughts for It Ends With Us because I'm sure last time that I mentioned liking the book, you were probably aghast. So let me clarify a few things. I feel like considering I was a little delulu on one hour of sleep and I had just filmed a rant video where I read out loud excerpts from Verity, which is like the worst book that I read all year. I think any other book that I could have read at that point in time would have been light years ahead of the pile of trash that was Verity. For It Ends With Us, honestly, I was just pleasantly surprised that the author even acknowledged that it was an abusive relationship in the first place. The way that people had talked about it made it seem like the book was supposed to romanticize abuse. I had interpreted that to mean that the relationship that you're rooting for is an abusive one that you should not actually be rooting for. So when I saw that there is another love interest who is the good guy and has a really sweet romance going on with the main girl and it's very clear that the abusive guy is the one that she should get away from and the story is more about her trying to leave an abusive relationship. Honestly, I was impressed by the bare minimum. <laughs> I was like, wow, she doesn't end it with an abuser? What remarkable progress for Colleen Hoover. It really just goes to show that if you keep your expectations extremely low, you will either meet those expectations and you won't be disappointed or you'll be pleasantly surprised like I was. Are there parts of the book that are ridiculous? Yes. Absolutely. It is literally about a florist named Lily Blossom Bloom who ends up in an abusive relationship, but every now and then she's reading her old diary entries, which she writes as letters to Ellen DeGeneres, which is honestly kind of camp. The main character has a really tough childhood because she grew up with a father who would abuse her mother. And so she writes letters to Ellen because she kind of saw the Ellen show as her form of escapism. So she's like projecting all this onto a stranger that she doesn't know. I feel like that's not really far off from teenage girls with the way that they can project onto celebrities. And I feel like when you're growing up at such a painful time in your life, you do cling on to things that maybe seem cringe, but if it's all you have, then so be it. I mean, when I was growing up in school, I was already dealing with the depression and thoughts about my life. And you know what I was obsessed with back in the day? Oran High School Host Club. But then I'd be like, well, I can't actually be dead because Oran High School Host Club isn't over yet. I need to finish the rest of this series. You know what does take me out though? Sometimes every now and then there will be like a serious moment. She's reeling from the physical abuse that she has dealt with at the hands of this asshole guy. And then she'll be thinking, it's okay, Lily, just keep swimming. You know, like that line from Finding Nemo where Ellen voices Dory, the fish that says, just keep swimming. I understand the sentiment. I'm not gonna dismiss anything cringy if it's what you need to get by in life. But every time she mentioned that line, I was like, girl. I also like the friends to lovers aspect because she had this childhood friend who was homeless at the time because he was also dealing with an abusive household. And she saw that he didn't have a home and then she would try to help him out. And they kind of helped each other out throughout childhood. But then something happened, so they're no longer together and they haven't been in touch in a while. And then they see 
see each other again as adults. And I just really like the kind of friends and lovers romance that takes the span of years and there's so much history behind there. And he gets introduced when you're starting to see more red flags pop up with the abusive guy. So you get to see the protective part of the childhood friend kick in because he sees the main girl as someone who saved his life. And to see her be in such a terrible situation, he has this need to want to protect her and be there for her. And it's just so much yearning and pining. And I eat that shit up because I am a simple bitch, okay? So when he was ready to fucking fight the abusive guy, I was like, let's rock and roll, bitch. Like, not only am I gonna indulge in my childhood friends, the lovers, protective man bullshit trope that I like, I'm also gonna see him beat up an abuser. What's not to enjoy about that? So yes, I did like it. However, as I have spent more time thinking about the book and like the downsides of it, I do understand people's criticisms. The weird thing about his abuse is that it makes it seem like like it's something that he can't control and it's something where like he just blacks out and he doesn't remember what happened and it's like these rage issues that just gets unlocked in him like he's a fucking werewolf or something that's not really the case for like actual abusers so it was weird to have it framed in that way also the conclusion that we have from the end of the book doesn't really set him up in a way that would be an ideal story to show how to properly walk away from an abuser by the time you get to the ending of the book there is like another person involved here that is a very vulnerable character and because the abuser guy is some part of the girl's life and this vulnerable character's life, which I think is very irresponsible and not something that you should do with a dangerous person. I feel like what the author is trying to do is show that people are not black or white, like people are not fully terrible monsters and that there are some redeemable qualities to them because there is literally a line early on in the book where the characters say something like, I think there's always some good and some bad in all of us or something like that. It was like her attempt at nuance, but I think the problem is Colleen Hoover is not good at nuance. So I think with her attempt at this, it doesn't really play off well. I feel like if she had just leaned in to the unrealistic indulgence of a story, like maybe even focus on the romance between like the main girl and the guy that's like actually good for her, rather than trying to show like the complexities of an abusive relationship and the psyche of an abuser, that would have done well for her and her skill set. I don't know yet. If I will make a separate video about this book. We'll see if I go more in depth into it or at least make more dumb jokes about how truly embarrassing some of the writing excerpts are. Now that I have gained more sleep, I have hopefully restored some of my brain cells and I'll be able to read better books. So I will keep you updated on that. Updating from San Francisco. So this week I'm hosting Melissa. Hi. And we had met each other because we traveled in Thailand last year. So then we reunited again for Kendall and Vlad's wedding. Yes. And she's never been in California before, so I'm hosting her for the week basically. I have been meaning to update the vlog because I recently read a very popular, highly anticipated <laughs> book that came out this year, and that was Yellow Face by RF Kuang. And Melissa also happened to finish the book around yep. the same time too, and we didn't plan that. Oh, 
Oh, also, we went to Green Apple Books, and at the front of the store, there was like the book Yellow Face, and right next to it, we found out was like a book by an Asian author, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but by Asian, she was more like one eighth Asian, but all of her books for this specific author always has like an, a very clearly Asian woman. But then when you flip over to the back cover and see her, that is a white lady. So that was interesting. I think the bookstore owner definitely did that on purpose. <laughs> they might have. We're rearranging it. <laughs> Yellow Face is about a white girl who has a best friend, mm -hmm. sort of. And the best friend is Asian and they're a very big shot writer. They had had like a bestseller, had all the prizes, everything. And they secretly wrote a new novel, told no one about it, except for the white girl. Mm -hmm. And then tragically, the Asian lady passes away and the white girl thinks, what if I publish this novel under my name? That's what my best friend would want for me, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's uh, an interesting premise that I was really looking forward to reading. The whole book was like a criticism of the publishing industry. You know, as she dives deeper into like these web of lies, you know, obviously it gets caught or like gets suspicious. Like she just dives like deeper and deeper into trouble. And it's basically like watching a very slow car crash. Like you know it's gonna oh. happen and it just like draws everything out. Yep. I wonder if this is like a very niche book because I don't know if like other people outside of, you know, readers or the book community oh, would be right. able to pick yeah. up as much. Like even the drama that happens that the character mentions, mm -hmm. it's stuff that like has happened before in the book community, yeah. but I don't know if anyone with like, like a regular person would be able to pick up on that. Yeah, I don't know because, well, I'm also very deep into the book community as, you know, translator working in a library, watching lots of booktube. So I, I'm yeah. like aware of all this stuff, even since like reading Yellow Face, I've seen it everywhere, happen everywhere. Yeah. Uh, it's way more out there than I thought it was. So it might be that I really liked the book because it was about the industry and specifically like criticizing the industry mm -hmm. hard. So I see what you mean that it won't be maybe for like a broader audience. They might not care enough about like the, the publishing industry in itself. I think we're both like pretty deep into the book community. So we were like aware of this stuff going on, but you liked the book way more than I did. Yes, I thought I it was did. like, eh. Wait, did you rate it like four or five stars? I haven't rated it yet because I will be putting everything into my spreadsheet when I get back home. Mm -hmm. But I think it'll be like a five stars or like wow. a 4.5 rounded up to five. Wow. Okay. It kept me engaged throughout all the book and like yeah. you said like the slow car crash happening you're maybe, like I maybe, love mess yeah, I love this <laughs> this is messy and I'm here for it watching her digging her own grave just deeper and deeper and talking herself into all of the shit that she does I was like no no how can you not <laughs> see what you're doing I feel like I would go with 3.5 I was also really engaged reading throughout the book like mm -hmm. I looked forward to reading it just because I wanted to know what would happen yeah. but I think I expected more commentary from RF Kuang. I expected it to go a little bit deeper. I felt like it showed me what I already knew about the publishing oh, yeah, industry yeah, yeah, and yeah. I kind of wish there was more commentary or nuance with it. At times it felt so cartoonish but I mean people are really are like that. What I thought was interesting was like for example the Asian author you know that passes away that the main character copies from. Like obviously the main character is not like a good person but the Asian author also is like a flawed character too mm -hmm. because she was shown as like pretentious and she's done some shady stuff yeah, too yeah. that like for I sure. won't say due to spoilers <laughs> but like she was kind of like an annoying person as yeah. well and I thought that was interesting because part of like what the main character resented about the Asian author was that she came from a wealthy background mm -hmm. and I think thought we would go further into that because sometimes they tap into like how privileged she is when it comes to wealth. That's another thing about like the publishing industry where it's very hard for you to be an author unless you're already like well off and like you can't be a full-time writer unless you have like a wealthy family or like a wealthy spouse. Mm -hmm. So it's much harder to like break into it compared to like someone from a lower class income. So I thought we would like dive deeper into other aspects of that. It would have been interesting too because RF Kuang is also very wealthy too. Mm -hmm. Like she comes from a really rich Asian family yeah. so I was like "Ooh, is she gonna like you know draw mm -hmm. some parallels to that we didn't dive deeper into that and then it just felt more like this is a resentful white person and this is an occasionally annoying <laughs> Asian person <laughs> you know what surprises me though there would be moments where like she has to like eat Asian food or whatever or, or eat Chinese food and she's like so disgusted by it <laughs> yeah. but it's weird because she also did so much research for yeah. the book that she copied so she knows so much about it but there's like this weird disconnect where she's very knowledgeable about Chinese
Chinese history to the point where she can answer questions about it in interviews. Yeah. But then she is so disrespectful to like the food and like other aspects. Some part of me also wondered, I don't know if this would be any better or not, but I also wonder what if there was like an author that had copied an Asian author's work, but this author is like, oh, I love like Asian culture, you oh, know, like yeah, yeah, the yeah, inverse yeah. of it, mm -hmm. right? Where, cause the main girl was like, I don't really give a shit about this. This is like yeah. just an opportunity hand to me. I'm curious about like fetishizing yeah. aspect of it. I think that would have been an interesting like alternate route to take. Yeah, cause she only dove into everything that was talked about in the book because she had a book coming out on a topic and she was like, oh, I didn't know this shit. So I let me look everything up real quick. I wonder yeah. if I highlighted anything from the book. She wrote, who has the right to write about suffering? And I felt like an interesting point that the book showed was like how the Asian author would take inspiration from like the trauma of like older yeah. Asians, even though she didn't quite experience that trauma and she has like a very privileged life. And that's why I wanted to like dive deeper into that because that felt like more nuanced than seeing like, oh, look at this terrible white person. Like the, the, the boundaries of like who can write about what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is an interesting conversation overall. I think a lot of like authors who are not white are expected to write stories about trauma. Trauma, yes. Yeah, and that's like the only thing that they can write about. And I think some part of it is like publishing pushing for that. But mm -hmm. then I think also people are just expected to only be able to write that. And, and the, yeah. the same thing about like the LGBTQ community. It's mm -hmm. as if that those stories can only be about the trauma of having to come out or the trauma of what they experienced in their youth. And it cannot be, we're better at it now but yeah. it couldn't be like just a joyous mm -hmm. story and well they happen to be gay or something like that and yeah i have the feeling it's the same with this it won't be taken seriously if it's like too joyous it has yeah. to be about trauma in order mm -hmm. for it to be like rooted in something that's taken seriously by critics yeah especially like in literature if yeah it has to be fancy literature it mm -hmm. has to be tear jerking <laughs> i feel like there were seeds of interesting things but it didn't fully explore it much as i would have liked oh, yeah. so I think I'll make a separate video where like I talk more about it because I still have like all these thoughts on these themes. Probably by the time I post this, that video will already be out. Well, I will update you next time as we explore San Francisco. Yes, bye. <laughs>Update for this vlog just to say that I have finished two books that will be my last two for the month the first one is a memoir called page boy written by Elliot page I really like the actor I first saw him in Juno and he did a really good job in that movie I saw videos of him doing a screen test when he was first auditioning and he's such a natural when it comes to acting especially at such a young age then I saw him in inception and hard candy I've always felt like he seemed to be a very down-to-earth actor. So I was interested in this memoir, especially since he narrates the audiobook. The book basically consists of anecdotes from his childhood, dealing with queerness, and also figuring out that he's trans. He grew up with a lot of bullying. Like from school, people would call him the F slur. In Hollywood, there was so much speculation about whether he was queer or not. So he definitely touches upon how a lot of times when you are a public figure, there are people who are just so adamant about speculating your sexuality even though it's none of their business. He talks about relationships that he's had with other actresses. There are some triggering topics like his experiences with his eating disorder and some incidents where he's been assaulted. The really sad part is when he was filming the movie Hard Candy, which is about his character who is 14 years old, pulls a reverse Uno on this nasty 30-year-old man who formed an online relationship with his character. But the character pulls a reverse Uno by spiking the old guy's drink and tying him up and the whole movie is about Elliot Page 
torturing the almost pedophile guy. I say almost because I guess where the gray area of the movie is, is that he technically didn't do anything physical with any children yet. That's like the big question. Like, would he have done something? Is that kind of vigilante justice that Elliot Page's character doing justified? But honestly, I didn't really have that much sympathy for the 30 year old dude anyway, because if you were talking to a 14 year old, that's on you. Despite the subject of this movie, he was actually assaulted by not just one, but two people that had been working on the movie. And I just found that to be so sad. So obviously he's been through a lot of shit. I think on a technical level, I would give this book three stars just because I've read other memoirs that I found to be much stronger. This one kind of felt like it jumped all over the place because we would jump from like childhood to some anecdote in present day to another time in a previous year. And because it jumped around a lot, it felt less cohesive to me. But I do appreciate that he is sharing his story and life experiences because especially now in the US with trans rights being in danger, I think it's super important for us to read about trans people's experiences. And he also notes that even though he struggled a lot with violence and bullying and assault, he is very privileged to be able to afford gender affirming surgery and be financially stable and not feel like he had been in an unstable home. Even though his dad was like an asshole, he is definitely a lot luckier compared to other trans people of color. The other book that I finished is called All the Dead Lie Down. This was one of my anticipated books for the year. This one is a contemporary young adult gothic romance. It's about this girl who lost her parents and she ends up getting an invitation from a horror writer and childhood friend of her mom. This letter invites the main girl to be a nanny for these two children who are living in this spooky little house. She accepts the invitation because she doesn't really have anything else going on in her life with her parents croaking and all that. As she is trying to be a nanny for these kids, they're acting kind of weird. Like they're burying their dolls. They're hosting funerals. Just typical shit that creepy children do in horror stories. What I'm not really a fan of is how passive this character is because she really just lets the children have beef with her. And it's like, dude, you can't just let them push you around. You have to do something. But it felt like for majority of the book, she was getting pushed around by a lot of the children. And I feel like a lot of times in these gothic stories, all the characters just say the vaguest shit and then the main character just puts up with it. The romance part kicks in when the eldest daughter of the house returns home unexpectedly. The main character finds herself to be very drawn towards the eldest sister. I'm finding that I don't think gothic stories are for me. I think it relies a lot on atmosphere. I don't think that's enough for me to be invested in a book. I found it to be very slow and then by the time the plot started showing some developments with explanations for what was actually going on, I found that I didn't really care enough to get through it. But I am looking forward to kicking the next month off with some new fun books to read. And with my new reading vlog, you will see a familiar face and that is my girlfriend. I think we're gonna try to buddy read some stuff as well. So I'll keep you updated for then. Otherwise, that pretty much wraps up my reading vlog for this month. Go ahead and unsubscribe from my channel and goodbye.